Okay, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, I'm very sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, we clearly should have had a bit more time to set up and prepare. Um, and I really don't, please try not to look ahead too far in the slides. Um, I know it's gonna be difficult, um, but there you go. Uh, okay, uh, so I'm gonna talk about web scraping best practices. Um, I originally called this advanced web scraping um, because we're going to touch on a lot of advanced topics. Um, but it's not advanced in the sense that you need to be past the beginner level or anything to understand it. Um, so I, I changed it to best practices, um, and I hope that everybody can follow this talk and understand what's going on. If you can't, please just uh, shout or let me know. Um, so a bit about me. Um, let's see, uh, eight years ago, about that, I started scraping kind of in anger, and that was around the time when we did the, scrap the scrapey web, our web scraping framework. Um, and since that time, we've been involved in a couple of other projects, uh, uh, including Porsche and Frontera. Um, if you don't know what they are, don't worry, I'll get to them later. Um, so why would you want to scrape? Well, uh, lots of good sources of data on the internet, and actually we come across a, a lot of companies and, and universities and research labs um, of all different sizes who are using web scraping. Um, but, you know, Getting data from the web is, is difficult. Um, you can't rely on APIs. You can't rely on uh, semantic markup. Um, so that's where web scraping come in. These are some stats. You probably can't read them very well um, because it's a bit small. Uh, but basically, um, web scraping has been on the increase recently. Um, we've seen that ourselves, but this has been also uh, something we've seen from uh, other companies reporting. These stats are from a company called Incapsula. Um, that provide anti-bot scraping technology. Um, and it's a sample of their customers, so it's probably not completely representative of the internet as a whole. Um, but still, it's, it's very interesting to see. And another thing that, it, that I can see from this as well is that um, smaller websites have a larger percentage of bot traffic, probably because they have less users, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, especially if you write bad bots, um, you know, they cause more trouble for smaller websites. Uh, smaller websites might have bandwidth limits, for example, um, and many HTTP libraries, they don't compress content. Um, so you, you'll easily go over and um, their bandwidth limits. Um, also, of course, you know, doing a bad job means your web scrapers are very hard to maintain. Um, this is a notorious problem, of course, because websites change. Um, so when I think about web scraping, I like to think of it as in two parts. Um, the first is actually getting the content. So it's finding good sources of content um, and downloading it. And then the second is the extraction. Um, actually extracting structured data from that downloaded content. Um, and I've kind of structured this talk in two parts as well that follows this. Um, so, and as an example of web scraping, um, I just said that Scraping Hub gets scraped all the time. And it's not just people testing out Scrapey or, or something like that or our tools. Um, but actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we posted a job ad on our website. And the next day, it was up on a job listing web board, job listing board. Um, and none of us posted it there. So we thought, well, how did that happen? Um, and I think we were probably scraped. Um, so a question for the audience would be to think about uh, how would you write that scraper? Um, I, I would break it down into, okay, how do I find good sources of content? And how do I extract that data? It turns out that we tweeted about the job. So hashtag remote working. Um, so maybe somebody picked it up from Twitter, got retweeted. Um, that would be an easy source of content. Um, and we did use semantic markup, so perhaps they extracted it from that. And, and that's a relatively, to write such a scraper that could do this is, is a relatively easy task. It, you could do it in a day, maybe. Um, but then if you wanted to do, say, to handle cases where people didn't use semantic markup, or you wanted to find people who didn't post to, or tweet about it, or, or post it to some other website, then it becomes a much bigger and much more complex task. And, and I think that kind of highlights the scope of web, web scraping from the kind of very easy, uh, cool, fun hacks that don't take very long to the very ambitious and very difficult uh, projects that, that happen. Um, so getting on, moving on to downloading. Um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna mention the Python requests library. Uh, probably many people know it. It's a great library for HTTP. Um, and doing simple things is simple, uh, as it should be. Um, but when you start scraping at a, at a little bit more scale, um, you really want to worry a bit more about uh, a few other things. Uh, like, for example, retrying requests that fail. Uh, certainly, when, when we started out, you know, you'd, you'd run a, a web scrape, and it, it might take days to finish. 
Um, and then about three quarters of the way through, you get a network error or you get a, uh, you know, the, the website itself that you're scraping would suddenly return 500 internal server error for 10 minutes. Um, so if you don't have some policy to handle this, uh, it's, it's a huge pain in the ass. So yeah, uh, you want to think about that. Um, I also, this, in this example, you can see I'm using a, a session. Um, well, I don't know if you can see it or not because it's small, but consider using sessions with Python requests. Um, sessions uh, handle cookies. They also use uh, connection keep alive. So you don't end up repeatedly opening and closing connections uh, to the sites you scrape. But I would say as soon as you start crawling, you really want to think about using Scrapey right away. Um, this, this little example here is not much code. It uses uh, Scrapey's crawl spider, which is a common pattern for scraping, uh, for crawling. Um, you know, just defining one rule, a start URL, and that's enough to go from the R your Python website for this conference to actually follow all the links to speakers, um, and you just need to fill in some code to parse the speaker details. So it's really not much code, it's, and it, it solves all the problems like highlighting, or solves all the problems like retrying, et cetera. Um, you can cache the data locally, which is good if you're gonna live demo stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, so a single, a single crawl like that often turns into uh, crawling multiple websites. Um, at PyCon US in 2014, we did a demo, um, and it's up on Scraping Hub's GitHub account. It's called PyCon Speakers, um, where we actually scraped uh, data from a whole lot of tech conferences. Um, this is a really good example to look at because it shows you can, it shows a way to manage um, and how a Scrapey project looks when you've got a lot of spiders. And Scrapey provides a lot of facilities for managing that, like you can list all the, sp all the spiders that are there. Um, a spider is a bit of logic that we write for a, a given website. Um, and it, it also shows best practices in terms of, you know, it's easy with Scrapey to, to put common logic in common places and share it across multiple websites. When they're crawling the same type of thing, um, there's a lot of scope for code reuse. Um, so, so definitely, if you're scraping multiple websites, but yeah, yeah scraping's a no-brainer. Um, so some tips for crawling. Um, find good sources of things. Um, some people maybe might not think about using sitemaps. Um, Scrapey actually has a sitemap spider that, that makes this uh, very easy and transparent. Um, but often, you know, it can be a much more efficient way to get to content. Um, and that also means, of course, don't follow unnecessary links. Um, yeah, this is, uh, you can waste an awful lot of resources for everybody following stuff that doesn't need to be followed. Um, consider crawl order. Um, yeah, so if you're discovering links on a website, it may, might make sense to crawl, um, to crawl breadth first um, and limit the depth you go to. This, this can help you avoid crawler traps where maybe you're, I don't know, repeatedly scraping a calendar, for example, and just going through the dates is a, is a common example. Um, I used to work at a, in a company before that had a, had a search engine and, you, and crawlers every now and then would enter, follow some link into it and would follow all the search facets and turn every permutation and combination of search. Um, and this generated a huge load, of course. Um, so as you decide to scale up, um, so uh, we, I was talking here about maybe single website scrapes, which is, I guess, the most common use case, at least, especially for scraping. Um, and you know, single website scrapes can be big, right? I mean, it's, we frequently do maybe hundreds of millions of pages. Um, but at scale, say for example, you're writing a vertical search or, or focused crawler, um, then we're talking maybe, maybe tens of billions or even hundreds of billions of discovered URLs. Um, so so you, you might crawl uh, a certain set of pages, but the amount of URLs you discover on, that page, on those pages, so your entire state that you need to keep in, in your URL frontier is what we, can be, can be much, much larger. Um, so maintaining all of that is, is, is a bit of a headache. Uh, it's a lot of data. And one common way to do it is people just write all that data somewhere um, and then perform the big batch computation to maybe to figure out the next set of unique URLs to crawl. Um, typically using Hadoop or MapReduce, uh, it's a very common thing. It, it's um, maybe Nutch is a good example of that. Um, and then incremental crawling uh, would be where you are continuous crawling actually would be where you're continuously feeding URLs to your, your crawlers. Um, this has the advantage that you can respond much more quickly to changes. Uh, you don't need to stop the crawl and resume it. Um, but also nowadays, maybe you want to repeatedly hit some websites. Maybe you're following you know, uh, social media or something like that or, or good sources of links. 
Um, so it's much more useful, um, but it's much more complex at the same time, and it's a, it's a harder problem to solve. Um, maintain politeness is the little point on the bottom, um, but there's something really you want to consider when you're doing it on any scale. I think almost anybody can fire up a lot of instances nowadays on EC2, um, our, our, your favorite cloud platform, um, and just download loads of links, download loads of pages really quickly um, without putting much thought into what those pages are. Um, or particularly the, the impact it's gonna have on the websites you're crawling. Uh, in, in a larger crawl where you're crawling from multiple servers, you would typically, oh sorry, you would typically um, only crawl a single website from a single server. And that server could then maintain politeness. And so you can ensure whatever your crawling policies are, you, you, don't, uh, you don't break it. Um, so uh, Frontera, I thought I'd briefly mention it. Um, Alexander Sibirikov gave a talk on it yesterday. Um, this is a Python project that we worked on, um, or we're working on, uh, that, uh, that implements this uh, crawl frontier. Um, so it maintains all the state about visited URLs and tells you what you should crawl next. Um, there's a few different configurable backends to it. So you can use it embedded in your scrapey crawl or you can just use it via an API with your own thing. Um, and you know it implements some more sophisticated revisit policies. So if you say want to go back to some pages more often than others and, and maybe you know keep keep content fresh, uh, it's, it can do that. Um, and I think Alexander particularly talked about doing it at scale. Um, so he had a, the crawl of the Spanish internet, um, and he's going to be talking about that in the poster session as well. So please come to that. Um, so just to summarize quickly, what we talked about downloading. Um, request is an awesome library um, for simple cases, but once you start crawling, um, it's better to move to Scrapey quickly. Maybe even you even want to start there. And if you need to do anything really complicated or sophisticated or at scale, consider uh, Frontera. So moving on to extraction. Extraction is the second um, part that, that, I, that I wanted to talk about. Um, of course, Python is a great language for extracting um, for extracting content or for messing with strings or messing with data. There's probably a lot of talks uh, at this conference about uh, managing data with Python. Um, but even just a simple, you know, uh, built-in features to the language and, and to, to the, the standard library make it very easy to play with, to play with text content. Um, regular expressions, of course, is, is, is one thing that's built into the library and probably, uh, yeah, we sh I should mention something about it. Um, it's regular expressions are brilliant for textual content. Um, yeah, it works great with things like telephone numbers or postcodes. Um, but if you find yourself ever matching against HTML tags or HTML content, you've probably made a mistake um, and there's probably gonna be a better way to do it. Uh, I see this code all the time of, of regular expressions and yeah, it works fine, but it's hard to understand and, and to modify. Um, and often it actually doesn't work fine. <laughs> Um, so other techniques, well, use HTML parsers. Um, so that we, have, we have some great options. Um, uh, yeah, so if you want, this is when you want to extract based on the content, or based on the, H, the structure of HTML pages. Um, so often you will say, okay, this area here, surrounded by this, underneath that table, um, is, HTML parser is absolutely the way to go. Um, yeah, so as a, just a brief example. Oh yeah, I, on the right-hand side, I just had some examples of HTML parsers. Um, LXML, HTML5 lib, li, beautiful soup, gumbo, and of course, Python has its own uh, built-in HTML parser. Um, I, I'll talk about them a bit more in a minute, so don't worry if you can't see that. Um, so just a, as a brief example of what they do is take some, um, take some raw HTML here that, that looks like text um, and, and create a parse tree. Um, my favorite way of dealing, and then you know, use some technique. Usually these, par these parsers provide some method to navigate this parse tree and extract the bits you're interested in. Um, I don't know if you can see that, so I'll skip this quickly, but uh, I, I quite like XPath um, as a way to do this. Uh, it, it's very powerful. You can, um, in this case, just select all bold tags or a bold tag under a div or you know, the text from the second div tag. Uh, it, it lets you uh, specify rules. It's really worth learning um, if you're going to be doing a lot of this. Uh, yeah, here's, a, here's an example from Scrapey. Uh, you don't really need to read that. Um, but basically, it just lets you, Scrapey provides a nice way for you to 
called XPath RCSS selectors um, on responses. Um, yeah, so this is probably the, the definitely the, the most common way to scrape content from a, a small set of known websites. Um, I, I definitely want to mention Beautiful Soup as well. Um, this is a very popular Python library. Um, maybe in the early days it was a bit slow, um, but the more recent version you can use different parser backends. Um, so you can even use use Beautiful Soup on top of LXML. Um, the main difference with uh, with the example I showed previously is that. Beautiful Soup is a, is a pure Python API, so you can navigate content using using Python constructs um, and Python objects versus XPath expressions. Um, the, the, the other thing is, of course, um, you might not need to do this at all. Maybe somebody has already written something to extract what you're looking for. Um, so yeah, definitely, maybe there's stuff you wouldn't even think of. Um, some examples of things that we've done. Um, is we wrote a, a, a login form mo th a module for Scrapey that uh, automatically fills in, log fills in forms and logs them into the websites. Um, we have a date parser module that takes uh, textual strings and, and uh, can, can build a date object from it. Um, and web pagers, another, another, um, another uh, project that we wrote which looks at a HTML page and will pull out links that perform pagination, um, which, which is often useful. Um, I was going to live demo this, but I think we're probably short on time, and um, yeah, maybe it's not worth tempting fate. We had enough technical problems already. Um, but uh, Porsche is a visual uh, visual way to build web scrapers. Um, it's applicable in many of the cases where we, I had previously mentioned where we would use XPath or Beautiful Soup. Um, but its advantage is it's got a nice UI where you can. Um, Visually, you say, oh, I want to select this element. This is the title. This is the uh, image. This is the text. Um, I was going to demo this uh, about scraping uh, the EuroPython website. Um, maybe we, if somebody wants to drop by our booth later, I can do it. I can show you. Um, but it, it's really good. Uh, it, it can save you a lot of time. However, um, it's not as applicable. You know, if you really want to be, if you, if you have some kind of complex rules, um, complex extraction logic, <coughs> Um, you can, you can. It might not always work with this. Um, and of course, if you want to use any of the previously mentioned stuff, like automatically um, extracting dates and, and things, there might not be built into Porsche yet. Um, so scaling up extraction, it's, Porsche is great. It's much quicker to write uh, extracting extraction for websites, but at some point it becomes pointless again. Uh, you might be scraping 20 websites. That's fine. 100 people have used it to scrape thousands. Um, but what about tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands? At this point, you want to look for different techniques. Um, there are some libraries uh, that can extract articles from any page. They're easy, easy to use. Um, I want to focus on quickly on a library called WebStruct that we worked on um, that helps with automatically extracting um, data from, from HTML pages. Um, and the example I'm going to use is named entity recognition. Um, so in, in this case, we want to find elements in the text and assign them into categories. Um, so we start with annotating web pages. So of the type of stuff, the type of, uh, we label web pages basically with what we want to extract um, as examples. Um, we're gonna use a tool called Web Annotator, um, but there are others. Um, here's an example of labeling. Um, in this case, we, we want to find organization names. Um, so the OT Cafe is an, is an organization. In, in a, and we would label it within a sentence within a page. Um, that format is not so useful for machine learning um, and for the kind of uh, tools we want to use. So we would, um, of course, that text is split into tokens. Each token in this case is a word. Um, and we label every single token in the whole page as being either outside uh, of the, what we're looking for, as being, or as being at the beginning of an organization, or inside an organization. And given that encoding, then we can apply more standard machine learning algorithms. Um, yeah, in, in our case, we found conditional random fields um, uh, as, as, a, as a good way to go about it. But it, an important point is that it needs to take into account the sequencing of tokens, um, or the sequencing of, of, yeah, of information. Some features, so it, we feed it basically not just the tokens itself, but actual features. Um, and the features can be things like about the token itself, um, but they can also take into account the surrounding context. And this is a very important point. 
um, we, we, take in, we can take into account the surrounding text or even you know, HTML elements that it's embedded in. Um, so it, 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 it can be quite powerful. Um, so one way to do it, and this is uh, what we've been doing recently, um, is to use our WebStruct project. Um, and this helps you know, load the annotations that were done previously in Web Annotator. Um, call, back your Python, call back to your Python modules that you write yourself to do the feature extraction. Um, and then it interfaces with, um, with something like Python CRF, CRF Suite um, to actually perform the extraction. So just, this is just briefly to summarize. Um, you know, we use slightly different technologies depending on the scale of extraction. Um, HTML parsing and Porsche are very good for a single page or single website, or for multiple websites if we don't have too many. Um, the machine learning approaches are very good if we have a lot of data. We compromise a bit on maybe the accuracy, um, but that's, that's the nature. Uh, I just wanted to briefly mention a sample of a project we've, we've done recently. Actually, we're still working on it. Um, you might know the Saatchi Art Gallery. Um, it's, a, it's a gallery of contemporary art in London. Um, and we did a project with them for the, to create content for their global gallery guide. Now, this is a, an ambitious project to sh showcase uh, artworks and artists and ex exhibitions from around the world. So it's a fun project, and it's nice to look at artworks all day. Um, so of course, we use Scrapey for the crawling. We deployed it to Scrapey Cloud, which is a scraping hub uh, uh, service for running Scrapey crawls. Um, and we, we used WebPager, one of the tools I mentioned earlier, to, um, to actually paginate. Um, so the crawl, we, we prioritize the links to follow. Um, so, we do, so using machine learning, so we don't um, try and waste too many resources on each website we scrape. Um, once we hit the target web pages, we then use WebPager to, to paginate. Um, so that's the crawling side. On the extraction side, we use WebStruct, very much like I previously described. Um, one interesting thing that came up, I thought, was that when we were extracting um, images for art or for uh, artists, it, we often got them wrong. Um, and we had to use a, a classification to, we actually uh, classified them um, based on the image content using face recognition to see which one were artists versus artworks. Um, so it, it's working pretty well. This is in, uh, scraping 11,000 websites, hopefully, to continue and increase. Um, so one important thing, of course, is to measure accuracy, um, to test everything, improve incrementally. Um, and it's also good to not treat these things like a, too much like a black box, try and understand what's going on, don't make random changes. Uh, it tends to not work so well. So uh, briefly, uh, we've covered downloading content, we've covered extracting. It seems like we have everything to go and scrape at large scale, but there's still plenty of problems. And I'm just going to touch on a few in the last five minutes. Um, of course, web pages have an irregular structure. Um, this can break your crawl pretty badly. It happens all the time um, from people using, superficially, some websites look like they're structured, but it turns out somebody was using a template in a word processor or something, and, and there's just loads of variations that, that kill you. Um, other times, I don't know, maybe the developers have too much time in their hands and they write a million different kinds of templates. Um, you can discover halfway through that the website's doing multivariate testing and, and it looks different the next time you, you run your crawl. Um, I wish there was a silver bullet or some solution I could offer you for these, <laughs> but there's not. Um, and another problem that will come up is, is sites requiring JavaScript, um, our browser rendering. Um, we tend to have, uh, we, we have a, a service called Splash, which is a scriptable browser that presents an API, uh, HTTP API. So this is very useful to integrate with Scrapey um, and, and some other services. Uh, you can write your scrapers in Python um, and just ha have the browser, you know, uh, have Splash take care of the browser rendering. Um, and we can script extensions based in, in Lua. Um, Selenium is, an, is another project. Uh, if you start thinking like, OK, follow this link, type this here, um, Selenium is a great way to go. Um, oh yeah, finally, of course, you can look at the web, web inspector or something, see what's happening. This is maybe the most common thing for scrapey programmers, because um, it's quite efficient. You can just, you know, often there's an API behind the scenes that you can actually use instead. Um, proxy management is, is another thing that you might want to consider, um, because some websites will give you different content depending on where you are. Um, we, we crawled one website that actually did currency conversion, um, so I thought w I was being very clever by selecting the currency at the start. But it turns out the website did a double conversion, and some products were like a, a cent or two different. Um, so didn't discover that one for, for ages. 
Um, so are they ban hosting centers often where they've had one or two abusive bots? It could be somebody else. Uh, this is just part of the nature of scraping in the cloud. Um, yeah, so for reliability, sometimes for speed, um, you, you might want to consider proxies. Uh, please don't use open proxies. Um, they sometimes modify content. It, it's, just, it's just not a good, good idea. Um, Tor, I generally don't like it for large content scraping. Uh, it's not really what it's intended for. But uh, we, we've done some things with maybe uh, government agencies or security in the security area where we really don't want any blowback from the scraping. Um, and, and, you know, it needs to be, really needs to be anonymous. Um, otherwise, there are plenty of private providers, but very in quality. Um, and finally, last slide is just briefly want to mention about ethics of web scraping. Um, I, I think the most important question to ask yourself is, what harm is your web scraping doing, um, either on a technical side or with the content that you scrape? Are you, are you misusing it? Are you hurting the, the sites you're getting it from? Um, yeah, so crawl at, on the technical side, crawl at a reasonable rate, uh, and it's best practice to use uh, a user, uh, to identify yourself via user agent and to respect robots.txt, especially on broad crawls. That's when you visit lots of websites. And um, that's it. Uh, do we have some questions? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Wonderful talk. One question. Imagine you have to log in into some website, and if you use a tool that will generate some fake credentials and stuff, for example, you have a profile of a programmer or a profile of a farmer or of a rock star and so on. Thanks. Okay, so about logging into websites. Well, the, the tool I mentioned just uh, finds the login box and lets you configure your, your user ID. Um, that you want to use. So it, it doesn't handle managing multiple contacts. Um, I have seen people do that, but uh, it's not something I've done myself. Um, yeah, so sorry, I, that's all I can say about it, really. Um, any, any other questions? Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for the Scrapey library. I mean, it's an awesome thing, and we are using it on that's, a daily that's, basis. That's great to hear. I, actually, it's the, these guys you should be thanking in the audience. Uh, yeah, thanks, I, I guys. I may have gotten the ball rolling, but um, stand up, guys, stand up. Um, but these are the contributors um, really here. <laughs> There's more of them up there, but I don't know why they're, they're being shy. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, go ahead. I probably have a few questions, but I'll only ask a couple, I guess. Sure. Uh, first, it's, I'd like to mention PyQuery. Why, yep. uh, that was an awesome development uh, change for us from XPath. Yep. And have you yep. maybe tried that? I mean, uh, this is one thing we use regularly, and it cool. proves, I mean, yeah, I, I've heard of it, but I haven't really played with it properly. So yeah, we'll, we'll check it out. And um, I think there might be scope for including other approaches to to um, to, to extraction. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And um, one is, did you maybe think about master spiders or spiders that can? Uh, you said that APIs are brittle, and yeah. But uh, you could still think of uh, web frameworks and. Some behave in similar ways, and maybe you could get a way to extract certain information from certain kinds of websites. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like we have a collection of spiders for all the forum engines, for example. Um, it's not individual websites, but it's the underlying engine powering it, and that works really well. Yeah, we're, we're building collections of those kind of things. Um, it, it, my example about APIs, I didn't really meant to diss API as, as, as in general. Um, they're often quite useful, but some cases they don't have the content you're after, um, and in some cases the content is maybe lags behind or it's a bit less fragile than what's on the website. Um, th that's been my, my experience, um, but definitely if there is a web an API available, you should you should check it out. Um, it works fine with Scrapey too. Okay, and just the last question, a little bit more technical. Sure. Um, do you have uh, plans for anything? Um, to, I don't know, to, uh, to handle throttling or to handle uh, robots.txt or 
to reschedule 500 errors or something like that. Yep. I know there's a auto throttle plugin. Yep. But that does, I mean, it slows you down significantly <laughs> on a good website. Yeah. Though yeah, it does yeah. work for be, uh, for slow websites. Thanks. Uh, you're welcome. Um, yeah, the, the throttling is an interesting one, and, and often internally what we do is we, we deploy with auto throttle by default, and then override it when we know the website can do better um, or differently. So it is, is a case, especially when you're crawling a, a single website or a small set of websites, it's worth tuning that yourself. It's hard to find good heuristics. Um, and, and definitely it's, it's something we do all the time when we write individual scrapers. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts about how we could um, come up with some better heuristics by default. Um, it's definitely a very interesting topic. Um, uh, yeah, and retrying, um, again, Scrapy does retry stuff um, the, by default, but you can configure the, for example, the HTTP error codes that signify an error that you want to be retried because they're not always consistent um, across websites. So thank you. Hi, so a slight follow-up to the retry thing. You mentioned this briefly under the talk. Um, yeah. Do you actually like do things like um, backoffs and jitters and stuff? Because uh, from my job, we have um, very interesting situations with synchronized clients and other fun. Uh, okay. That yeah, is good to avoid. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. And actually, um, I, I glossed over a lot of details. Um, I mean, I said we run in Scrapy Cloud. Uh, but that takes care of a lot of the kind of infrastructure that we typically need. Um, and uh, Alexander gave a talk on the crawl frontier, which is crawling at scale. And there's a lot more that goes into that, 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 it, that it happens outside of Scrapy itself. Um, a very good, the first thing, of course, that we noticed as soon as we started crawling from EC2 is DNS errors all over the place. Um, but th there, there's several technical hurdles um, that you need to overcome, I think, to do, it, to do a, a larger crawl at any scale. Okay, thank you, Shane. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.